We are pleased to be joined by Secretary Lonnie Bunch, the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. As Secretary, uh, his responsibilities include overseeing 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, several research centers, and numerous educational units. He is the first historian as well as the first African American to hold this prestigious position. Previously, Secretary Bunch served as the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture from 2005 through 2019. He wrote about his experiences in his deeply personal book, A Fool's Errand, creating the National Museum of African American History and Culture in the age of Bush, Obama, and Trump. In addition to Secretary Bunch, this museum came to fruition in no small measure due to the persistence of the late Congressman John Lewis. For 15 years, Congressman Lewis introduced a bill into every congressional session to establish the museum until it finally passed in 2003. I look forward to hearing a bit more about Congressman Lewis's important contributions in tonight's conversation. I'm also pleased that we have the Pulitzer Prize winning author and historian and my friend Taylor Branch joining us. Taylor is perhaps best known for his trilogy of books, America in the King Years. This series required more than 24 years of intensive research. Since 2005, he served with Secretary Bunch on the Scholarly Advisory Council, making the plans for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. In 2009, Taylor published The Clinton Takes, Wrestling History of the President. This groundbreaking account of the presidency is based upon hours and hours of one-on-one -on -one conversations between Taylor and President Clinton over the eight years of his presidency. Thank you, Taylor, so much for making time to join us uh, with your very busy schedule. We'll begin our program with a presentation from Secretary Bunch, which will be followed by a conversation between the Secretary and Taylor, and we'll conclude with remarks from my friend and colleague, Skip Rutherford, the Dean of the Clinton School of Public Service. It is now my honor to introduce the remarkable Secretary Lonnie Bunch. because in part I get to spend time with Taylor Branch, who I respect so much and I have been fortunate to work with for almost 15 years. What I'd like to do is to frame the conversation around the building of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I guess the best way to begin this conversation is to look at what has shaped me as I thought about this museum. Early in my career, I was doing an exhibition on the history of 19th century America. And part of it was looking at the story of slavery. So I traveled around the country looking at different plantations. And then I found a plantation that was a rice plantation. And standing next to slave cabins that were built in the 1840s was a man named Princey Jenkins. And Princey told me all about these cabins. But after the end of our conversation, he said to me, I'm not sure what a historian does but maybe your job is to help people remember not just what they want to remember, but what they need to remember. And in many ways, the challenge of helping people remember what they need to know about the African-American experience has been a hundred year struggle. This idea began when there was a lot of celebration about the end of the Civil War, and all of those celebrations omitted African-Americans and yet 200,000 African-Americans participated in the war. This led to this desire to, there must be a presence on the National Mall. They actually began to raise money, and it looked like something might happen, and then World War I occurred. This idea got traction again in the, in the 1920s, and even legislation was passed, but then the Great Depression. This idea floated around for generations. People would talk about it, and then nothing would happen. And then in the late 80s, uh, Congressman Mickey Leland said, this is an important idea, and he began to raise it again. He partnered with Congressman John Lewis. And after Mickey Leland's unfortunate death, Congressman Lewis introduced legislation for almost two decades to get this museum passed. And there's no doubt this museum was passed because of the perseverance, 
the resilience and the presence of John Lewis. And it was passed in 2003, signed by President Bush. I came back in 2005 to build this museum. And when I came back, we had a staff of two people. We had no idea where the museum would be. We had no collections at all. Obviously no building, no architect. What we had was really, first of all, a commitment to create the first 21st century museum of the Smithsonian. To think about what does it mean to interpret history, to interpret race, whether it's through technology, whether it's through traditional artifacts. We knew we wanted to be the first modern museum of the Smithsonian. But the other thing we had was a vision of what this could be. On the one hand, we wanted a museum that would help America remember. Remember the African-American past. This would be a museum that would help people think in new ways about the people they already know, the Martin Luther Kings, the Sojourner Truths, the Frederick Douglass. But it also had to be a place that would return to the narrative all these people who have been forgotten. It had to be a place where you could understand the story of an enslaved woman who got up every day to feed her kids before she went into the fields and how she refused to let the field strip her of her humanity, of her hope. It had to tell about families that left Mississippi for the south side of Chicago during World War I. It also had to tell the story of people who worked, who died, who struggled, to help America live up to its stated ideals. In essence, it had to help America confront its tortured racial past. It had to be a place that said, you will cry when you ponder the pain of slavery and segregation, but you'll also find the joy that is in that community. You will tap your toes to Duke Ellington, or Louis Armstrong, or somebody from the hip hop world, I had no idea who it would be, but you'd still tap your toe. And that, in essence, we wanted this to be a place where America remembered. But we realized that if it only remembered, I'm not sure that's enough. What we wanted to do was to build a museum that would use African-American culture as a lens to understand what it means to be an American. In essence, the goal was, this is not a museum about Black people for Black people. In essence, this was a museum that said, the African-American experience is the quintessential American experience. If you wanna understand who we are, our core values as Americans, values of spirituality, resiliency, optimism, where better to look than the African-American community? And if you wanted to understand the promise of America and the limits of that promise, where better to look than this community? So the goal was to say, this has to be seen as everybody's story. That it has to be seen as a way that said, we are all, whether we have been in this country 200 years or arrived 20 minutes ago, we are all profoundly shaped by this community. And then it was crucially important to also think of the museum as a way to understand the impact of international issues, to say that, Americans need to understand how they've been shaped by global considerations and how the African-American experience, its culture, profoundly shaped the world. And I always tell the story that it really came home to me how important African-American culture was globally when I was on a trip to northern Scandinavia and I was meeting with the indigenous community and somebody asked me through the translator, are you an American? The answer was yes. And then they said, do you know Al Green? And I said, Al Green the singer? And they said, yes, they loved Al Green. So I'm thinking I'm in the middle of nowhere and African-American culture touches that. So it made me think about how we did that. But then finally, the thing that we really wanted to do is recognize that no institution has broad enough shoulders to tell all these stories. So we felt it was important to be a place of collaboration to work with museums, but also to think about different partners, partners who can help us with technology, partners who could help us understand the internet. And so in a way, the goal was that 
If it was a museum that just touched Washington, we failed. If it was a museum that allowed communities around the world to bring their own stories, then I think we were successful as a museum. And that ultimately, there were a myriad of challenges, many of which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But I think that what, is the, what was one of the most challenging moments and that people like Taylor Branch and the scholarly advisory body were so important was really realizing, how do you conceptualize an African-American museum? Out of all the stories you tell, how do you determine what is in and what is not? How do you answer questions like, what's the role of Africa in an African-American museum? What does national really mean in a transnational age? In essence, how do you create a museum that does something that is really important for the public, and that is to help the public embrace ambiguity? In other words, help the public not look for simple answers to complex questions, but rather help the public grapple with nuance, subtlety, complexity. So how could a museum in many ways be a place that would allow us to find reconciliation and healing? How can a museum tell the unvarnished truth, as our friend John O. Franco used to always remind us, how could it tell the unvarnished truth but still give people hope? And so in a way, what we really wanted to do with this museum was to help the public by defining reality, but also giving hope. What we wanted more than anything else was to help people understand that though this is a people's journey, a journey of a community, it is also a nation story. So in many ways, that's what we tried to accomplish. And before I turn it over to Taylor, the thing I think that has been so powerful to us has been that it took us 11 years to open the museum, but it did so much of what we wanted. We had hoped that we would have 4,000 people a day. The museum was getting 8,000 people a day. We hoped that it would be a place that would introduce new people to culture, to museums. And it turned out that almost 30% of the audience who came to the museum had never been in museums as adults. So suddenly we were really introducing this to new people. And for me, what was so powerful is that 44% of the visitors who came to that museum were non-African American, in essence, making it the most diversely visited museum in the world to make sure that it became a story for us all. So ultimately, I think that building a national museum was something that a lot of us made a commitment of many, many years. But I think for all of us, it was worth it to say we could fulfill the dreams of all those generations who wanted something on the mall. And for me, personally, it was so powerful to be able to do this with John Lewis, to be able to have John Lewis at the opening, along with President Bush, President Obama, President Clinton, having John Lewis say that this was not a building, but really the culmination of the hopes and dreams of so many people. For him, it was a symbol that the civil rights movement was successful and had great impact. So ultimately, building the National Museum really gave us an opportunity to think about how do you use the past in order to contextualize the present and point us towards a better tomorrow. Thank you. And let me now talk and turn to my dear friend, Taylor Branch. Thank you. I am unmuted. That's good. Thank you, Lonnie. <laughs> Lonnie is a treasure. And uh, I think you, everyone has heard um, an overview of the experience of this museum. I want to come back to John Lewis and talk personally about him because he, he has meant a lot to both of us. But first, I want to try to get through some questions about the museum in a larger sense, because um, we have a limited time, and I want to try to get out information on a lot of different topics. First of all, 
many people might think that having waited over 200 years to have this museum, that the, all, every space on the mall that was decent would be taken and this museum would be way, way off in Virginia somewhere. And instead, it appears to me to be the prime position on the mall, just below the, the ellipse and caddy corner from the Washington Monument. How did the museum wind up with that prime real estate? Well, what's so interesting is traditionally Congress tells the Smithsonian put a building in a particular place. But in this case, there were thoughts that it should be far off the mall, um, maybe in old buildings. And then there was this empty space next to the Washington Monument that some people thought, well, that should always remain empty. It shouldn't be the spot for the museum. But we knew, um, and you remember those conversations, Taylor, that this museum really had to help change the National Mall, because the mall was where the world comes to understand what it means to be an American. And it was crucial for this to be on the mall. And we got it in part by simply taking the regents and the people who were gonna make the decision, we took them on a tour. We said, look at this space way off the mall. Is that right? But look at this space that really allows a museum to interact with the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, Washington Monument. So ultimately, it was a no-brainer. But I must admit, um, it's transformative by being on the mall rather than off the mall. Absolutely. And, and providential that, that that place was still there. There were problems with it, including the fact that it was sitting on a, sitting on a swamp. So could you t just talk briefly about the problems of how to sit a museum there on top of that old river? Well, I'll tell you, we initially thought, okay, it's, this is the swampland and there's probably an underwater creek. So we designed the, you know, smart engineers designed the foundation to be part of a creek. Well, it turned out that it wasn't a creek, it was an aquifer of water, it was a bubble. And that bubble, the pressure from that bubble was what was keeping the Washington Monument standing. So the key is you did not want to burst that bubble because, you know, there are many things I don't mind people saying about me, but Lonnie Bunch knocking down the Washington Monument, I wasn't convinced that's what I wanted. But what happened was that there was just so much water that as we began to dig, uh, the, the foundation filled up with water and we couldn't figure out how to fix it. And I have to be honest, early in the process, as all the engineers began to scratch their head and said, um, I don't know what else we can do, I remember thinking, I'm going to be known as the guy that built the largest swimming pool on the National Mall. Um, but luckily, wonderful engineers from around the world came up and said, here's how you control that water. But let's be honest, that that was, in my mind, the biggest fear, that we would never be able to build on that spot because the water was just everywhere. People who come to the museum, the first thing they see is they see the vision of the museum in the distance as they approach all these newcomers. Could you talk a little bit about just the basic design of what you see, the corona, and how it tells a story and the impression that we wanted people to have um, just as a piece of art almost in, in the basic structure of the museum? I think it was important um, to recognize how strong a good architectural statement would be. Um, I had come back from being president of the Chicago Historic Society. In Chicago, architecture is the key. And so I thought that we wanted to create, first of all, a signature building, but also the first green museum on the mall. But we wanted a building that would speak of black culture, of African culture, of American culture. So the architects had a brilliant idea to create a kind of tiered corona um, that was going to be solid bronze because I wanted there to be a reminder that there had always been a dark presence in America that often was overlooked or undervalued. And so as they began to work with the corona, um, which was shaped in part by African Yoruba traditions, um, that they said, well, we can't have solid, so solid, so we're gonna have to punch holes in. And I remember thinking, I'm paying too much money for holes. So I went down to New Orleans and took pictures of the ironwork of enslaved craft people um, who did the ironwork in New Orleans and in Charleston. And that's what's over the entire building. So the building as it gleams in the sun 
is a reminder that so much of America was built by people who we'll never know. And this was our way to pay that homage. So I wanted it to be not a building that looked like everything else on the wall, but a building that reminded us of the richness, of the optimism, of the hope that was in an African-American community. What a thrill to see those early drawings. That was, that was quite, quite a, a saga to get there. Lonnie, I remember a lot of stories when old fogies like us, including both you and me, yep. confronted the, the fact that this museum would be the first one that people would carry cell phones into and they would be, they would be doing all kinds of things while they were in there, uh, interactive, that, that, that they would have the capacity to leave the museum, to visit it when they weren't there and leave it when they were there. Mm -hmm. um, we were mindful of 21st century technology. In view of that, and you, you might say a little bit about that, but I'm curious about how COVID, looking forward, we're now thinking about how people are gonna to go to museums now when we can't even be there. And what value does the, the experience in creating this 21st century museum have looking forward for how people are gonna to relate to museums in the future? I think it's an important notion that this museum was born digital. So what it meant was that the staff has or was already comfortable with thinking about both bricks and mortar but also the digital world. And if you look at the impact of COVID, what I've said to people is, first of all, um, we will never go back just the way it was. Um, and so therefore, rather than just plan to, how do you handle this moment? The goal is to use this moment to ask fundamental questions to do things differently. For example, we now know because of this virus that more Americans are comfortable receiving content digitally than ever before. So therefore, what we've done at the Smithsonian, for example, is really accelerate the work that we were doing with American women history, Women's History Initiatives, with our sort of open access. We've recognized that the goal is to push out our educational content, our scholarly content. So for me, the question is, how do we find the right tension between tradition and innovation? Because there will be millions that will still come to the buildings but we wanna make sure that we reach out to those that are less comfortable with coming and those that may never get there. And I think it also means that within a building, you've gotta think different. One of the strengths of any museum, but especially the African American Museum, is people who don't know each other come together around an artifact or an exhibition. Are people gonna to wanna to do that? So really we have to think about how do you create that sense of community, but still social distance? Um, how do you limit the numbers of people in spaces? Um, and how do you make sure that there's a stronger connection between what you would see when you come in and what you can then build on when you go home? So I think that it's raised fundamentally different notions about how staff works. Um, can you really telework as much as we've been doing? Raises fundamental questions about when, how do you create new business models? Um, what are the new revenue models you create? What do you do with e-commerce? So in a way, this is an opportunity not just to say, how do I get through it? It's an opportunity to say, how do we become even more nimble, more 21st century? Can you share uh, any details of the Obama family's visit to the museum uh, a few nights before it opened? You know, um, I knew President Obama from our time in Chicago, and it was really great to have him in the White House. But he used to always say to me, you got to make sure the brother gets to cut the ribbon. You know, he wanted to make sure that, uh, that we finished it while he was still in the White House. So I would go into construction meetings and I'd say, sure would be nice because I was talking to the president. Can we move a little faster? Um, so it was really powerful to be able to introduce him to the museum. And I remember... Uh, the night he brought his, you know, Michelle came, the children, his mother-in-law, and we walked through the museum. And um, he began to tell stories about what this meant to him or what other stories meant to him. And then we got to the piece that begins to look at 1968. And 1968, um, as you know, was an unbelievably important moment, but it's also a moment ripe with sound. And so there was a lot of wonderful music and suddenly, President Obama starts to dance. And his daughters gave the look that every father has gotten 
they, they rolled their eyes and they said, please don't embarrass us. And the president said, I'm dancer. And so what I love was that it wasn't the first family coming through. It was any family coming through, sharing the history, sharing the joy, sharing the pain. So that told me that I thought we hit it right, that it was going to give people that moment to learn from it, to bring their own experiences, and to be made better by it. I remember that wonderful story. Another small detail, I hope this is not too personal, but that, that he noticed the stone from, from Nashville that was there and had been marked in white history for 150 years as a stone that Andrew Jackson stood on to give a speech. But in fact, it was a stone for a slave auction. And, exactly. and what struck him was the tragedy that one culture would see it as a, as a place where somebody gave presidential speeches and the other cult culture knew it at, by its principal function, which was to auction off human beings. And that's kind of the, the gap that, you know, the museum has to confront in bringing those stories together. I think that's right. I think that um, part of what you recognize in a museum like this is you get to reinterpret things. Um, you know, for example, one of the things that President Obama and we looked at was we had a cabin from the enslaved that was from Edisto Island from the 1850s. And when you first look at it, um, you know, you're torn. It's a slave cabin. And initially it was built with just one door so that the overseer could see um, the enslaved people. And as soon as freedom came, the enslaved family cut out a back door so that they could have freedom. And for me, that was a so powerful because it said, how do you define, redefine yourself as free? Having the opportunity to go out a back door without somebody watching you was really a major victory. So those little stories are what I think helps make the museum even richer. Can you discuss a couple of your favorite uh, artifacts uh, and possibly some that you didn't quite get that you're still after. <laughs> you probably won't disclose that. Um, but I, I do remember one that might be instructive to begin by talking about the, the discussions that went on for a lot of, of time and disagreement over whether to put Emmett Till's casket in the museum. Yeah. Um, could you describe what went into that decision to have it or not to have it? So, Part of what you want to do in a museum of that type is to find the right tension between moments that will make you cry and moments that will give you resiliency. And I had gotten to know Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till Mobley, um, through a dear friend, Studs Terkel. Um, and Mrs. Mobley came to visit me in Chicago, and we were supposed to have an hour lunch, and she spent seven hours telling me what happened from the time she kissed her son goodbye Till the time she buried him. And she said to me, we became friends, I wrote about her, and she said to me that remember, for 50 years she had carried the burden of Emmett Till, and now it was my turn. And she subsequently passed away. I moved back to the museum, uh, to Washington. And then there was that discovery that Emmett Till's original casket was sort of thrown around in a shed because Emmett Till had been disinterred when the Justice Department revisited the case. He was reinterred in a new casket and the original one was supposed to be taken care of and it wasn't. So the family reached out to me and said, will you collect this? And I remember thinking, is this ghoulish? We talked a lot about that. Should we collect these kind of things? And then the conversation was, okay, we can collect it and preserve it, but maybe we'll never let anybody see it. And then you remember, we had these long discussions about, um, is that something that becomes exoticizing Emmett Till's body? Um, and what we realized is that this really was not just a story of Emmett Till, but it really was a story of his mother, of the kind of courage that she had to demand that the casket remain open. So suddenly the casket wasn't something ghoulish, but it was central to understanding that story. And so we recreated the sense of the funeral of the church. Um, and then we had sort of a video of people who experienced this telling the story of Emmett Till. And for me, this was really a really controversial thing we did. And it's become one of the most sacred spaces in the museum. Um, almost everybody wants to see that 
and feel the, 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 the strength and the pain. And the best story I can think of is one day I was standing near the casket and a young African-American woman in her 20s, uh, I guess, was just discovering the story and she broke down and started crying. Then there was a sort of elderly African-American, elderly American, uh, white American who basically looked at her and said, I'm feeling the same pain. Do you mind if we cry together? And they hugged each other and they cried. And they talked about how th this brought them together. And that's one of the powers of a museum. It, it certainly is. And you know, when I was doing my 20 something years of work on the, the trilogy, I can't tell you how many people I interviewed who said that seeing the photograph of Emmett Till in that casket on the cover of Jet was a transformative motion, a moment for them. You know, John Lewis and Julian Bond and the people who mm -hmm. led the sit-ins five years after Emmett Till died uh, were of the same age. And they saw those Jet magazines and said, that could be me. So that was a transformative image and starting a, a story that we're still living with in the, in the, in the legacy of, of John Lewis. And, and so you see that the, these things these things are larger that when you wince, you also wonder and, 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 and you grow. And so it, it will help people understand the transformative potential of the George Floyd exactly. video. You know, Emmett Till was like that. It was, it was an image that broke through people's resistance and it had a lot of consequence. So um, what other artifacts stand out in your mind? Um, uh, well, let me tell you, let me tell you too. One that means so much to me is that we spent a lot of time trying to find remnants of a slave ship in order to sort of help people understand the international slave trade. So we went to Cuba trying to find things. And then I had taught in South Africa for many years. And so some of the people in South Africa knew me and said, well, you know, we think we might have found a slave ship that sank off the coast of Cape Town. Can you bring your expertise? And we brought scholars together to really find the ship and then bring remnants of the ship up. Because I thought that we wanted relics because they were sacred. And when we found it, I realized the ship had left Lisbon, had gone all the way to Mozambique and picked up 512 people from the Makua tribe, and then on its way back to the New World sank. Half of the, quote, cargo was lost, the other half was sold. So I felt the need to go to Mozambique and to meet with the Makua people. And so I did, and it was very powerful. Um, there was a ramp that would lead you down to the water, and they called it the ramp of no return. But mm -hmm. the chief came up to me and he said, um, I want to give you a gift. And he gave me a vessel that was wrapped with cowrie shells. And when I opened it, it was full of dirt. And I'm trying to figure out what this gift is. And then he said to me that his ancestors have asked that, can I take this dirt, take it back to the site of the wreck, the Sao Jose, sprinkle it over the site of the wreck, so for the first time since 1794, my people can sleep in their own land. And to me, that was just so transformative. And to be able to do that, to fulfill his ancestors' dreams, meant a lot to me. So I think that in some ways, this was a journey that was international. It was a journey that forced us to sort of know more stories and be able to share those stories. But I guess the other one that is always something that I think about is Chuck Berry's Candy Apple Red Cadillac. When I called Chuck Berry, I asked him for, the, for one of those early guitars that he wrote Maybelline and some of those songs on. And he said, well, I'll give you the guitar if you take the car. Now, I didn't want a 1972 Cadillac, but luckily I had smarter staff than me. And they said, oh, this is really important. You should collect it. So then they convinced me not only to collect it, but to put it on display in our gallery looking at music. And I remember thinking, why would I do that? Well, it's become one of the number one spots to photograph. Chuck Berry's Candy Apple Red Cadillac is one of the stars of the museum which reminded me always to listen, to recognize that it was the smartness of the staff that allowed us to fulfill these dreams.
there were a couple of other artifacts that couldn't have been put into the museum unless they were put in before it was completed. <laughs> Could you describe a couple of those? Because they were too big. Um, you know, one of the joys is that I had ideas and then it took people years to figure out how to implement them. And one of the things we wanted was a guard tower from Angola prison. That the notion of not discussing uh, the penal system would be a great omission. And to help people understand the long history of the convict lease system, um, we felt that we needed something substantive. And so um, one of our curators, Paul Gardulo, had been able to sort of spend time in Angola and got them to donate the guard tower. Well, I also wanted uh, a railroad car that I thought initially would be a Pullman car. And I talked to a, an old friend who was a donor at the Museum of American History, and he said, well, I don't have a Pullman car, but I've got a segregated rail car. So I went down to Tennessee, we went into the woods, and there was this unbelievable car falling apart. But we, we decided, let's bring them both. We restored the cars, and then we had to bring them from, we brought the Angola Tower up to Kentucky, and then we drove, shrink-wrapped them and drove uh, to, the, uh, to the site. But they were so large, we suddenly had to realize you better put them in before the building was complete. So suddenly it became a huge initiative. How do you do this? Can you put them in the right place? And so I remember the day we did it, we had these huge 500 ton cranes, lifted them in, and suddenly the public came and were cheering because they became the first artifacts in the museum. Now, the sad news is, that another director 50 years from now is going to say, can we move those? Nope. Uh, so they're there forever. I'd like to talk a little bit about John Hope Franklin, who was the head of the scholarly committee um, when I started. Um, and what makes me think of him especially now is, of course, he was from Tulsa. And um, one of the themes in the museum, we have a whole section called Making a Way Out of No Way, which is essentially mm -hmm. about resilience. I thought I knew something about the Tul Tulsa massacre of 1921, but I'm learning a lot more today. And it makes me appreciate all the more that John Hope Franklin came out of that experience uh, and, and turned it in to one of the most um, gifted scholarly careers in black history that, that ever lived. And he was our chairperson until he died. I'll never forget going down to Duke and he took me into his orchid museum, you know, <laughs> yes. hot houses out there and he, he loved growing orchids and everything. What a wonderful man came out of the disaster of Tulsa. So could you talk a little about John Hope? I think that we were all fortunate to be schooled by John Hope Franklin. Um, in many ways, John Hope was the sort of initiated so much of the scholarship over the last 50, 60 years. Um, but what was wonderful was that he would say, I want to help you get this museum right. And he would come to the meetings and he would lead the meetings. Um, and he would challenge us to think about difficult issues, to think about how do we use the museum to sort of use the title of his book as a mirror to America. Um, and what I remember more than anything else is sitting next to him and then he'd whisper in my ear and he'd always say things like, remember, tell the unvarnished truth. And then I think the words that inspired us all, he said, if you're going to do this right, people have to walk through the museum and be changed. And I think that he inspired us to really think about this more than just a museum but as a, as a site that will help a country come to grips with its tortured racial past and maybe find a better future. And I feel so blessed that I've been able to work with John O. Franklin, John Lewis, um, that in many ways, what this told me is that the most gifted people in America who were interested in issues of race and fairness would help us. And everybody did, and I just think, I'm so grateful for being able to have basically our own graduate level course with John Hope Franklin. <laughs> we had a question from Tony Panay of the Reagan Foundation saying, how does, a, how does a museum like this tell a story that's an American story when the American story is not one? That the, how do you 
basically tell two stories that are in conflict. You know, you can really say in, in one respect that the American race story started in, in violence because slavery's heart was violence in his military. And mm -hmm. we still have a legacy of that in the police. There's still a lot of people who think we're not safe uh, racially across the lines unless the police can use chokeholds. Uh, we still have uh, a story that's divided um, by kind of military instincts. Um, how would you describe the, the, the challenge of making two stories into one story and one story into two stories? I think in some ways, the word I always use is tension, right? Is to find the right tension that says that here are stories that are difficult for people to explore. But yet, if you do it in a way that humanizes it, often what happens is that we talk about slavery, we talk about violence, we talk about migration, but we don't reduce the human scale. And so part of what we wanted to do in the museum, whether it was the choice of images and the size of the images, whether it was making sure that every artifact, how difficult the story was, that it was a story, that it was a narrative, and that that reducing it to human scale suddenly allowed people to interact, to interact with it, who might normally not say, I don't want to really know much about slavery, but suddenly when you're seeing it through the lens of a particular family, I think it's very, very powerful. I always think of the example of uh, a man named Joseph Trammell, who was enslaved and gained his freedom in Virginia, and he had his freedom papers. And he knew how valuable those papers were because they were the key to his future but he had to carry it with him. So he was not very good with his hands, but he made a handmade tin wallet so he could carry it to make sure those papers wouldn't be destroyed. But what I love is that then he would go home at night and take the papers out and put it on the mantle and talk to the families, talk to his family about freedom and about America. I think people who may not want to talk about slavery could understand it because we could see it through his lens. Yeah. The the gift of the museum in part is that human dimension and allowing people to feel things that are that are that are so personal that they skip over all the labels of of, of black and white and militant and and a cultural division it seems to me that one of the problems in america today that the museum may help address and i'm curious whether you think this or not it seems to me that a lot of education is getting away from um, humanities, the arts, the things that tell us how to relate to one another uh, and just learn how to pass your, your math and reading SAT score test. Mm -hmm. and, and that one of the problems of American uh, education and American citizenship for that matter is that, that we're losing to some degree what this museum is trying to restore and that is yeah. the things that are personal, so personal and powerful that they can transcend these cultural divides. I think you put your finger on what is both the challenge and the opportunity. Like you, at this moment, I see more people asking questions about history. What was the Tulsa massacre? Um, help me understand what happened in the 1960s with the election of Richard Nixon and a movement from, away from focusing on social justice to focusing on law and order. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the challenge for those of us that care about history is to make sure that through the museums, through the op-eds that you write, through the books we write, but also through helping to shape the conversations that you hear on television, that we're really helping people understand more about who they are historically. And to recognize that these are not new, new moments. These are part of a long tradition where America has this entanglement entanglement of freedom and discrimination. Um, and so what you want is people to understand how we got to where we are, but to recognize that if you look at the African American experience, you cannot help but be somewhat hopeful. Because here is a group of people, a community, that imagined an America that wasn't there. That all of, at almost every moment when it struck for freedom, it enriched and enlarged America's notions of citizenship, of freedom, of opportunity. So in many ways, what is so powerful to me is that if we could help people become more historical, understand the past better, they will be able to grapple more effectively with the world we're dealing with today. 
Uh, well said. Let's talk a little bit about John Lewis personally. Um, uh, we, we share a long, long um, acquaintance with him. And now that he's passed, I, I wouldn't mind telling a few John Lewis stories. You know, I, I met him in 1968 when we challenged Lester Maddox in Chicago at the Chicago Convention. Mm -hmm. We brought up a challenge delegation and John and I were both part of it. I was basically a coat carrier. I was 21. <laughs> uh, but, and then he hired me the next year to work for the Voter Education Project. Um, but years later, when I started doing my research, he told me the story of preaching to the chickens. And um, <laughs> I put it in parting the waters, and he was very upset with me. He called me and, and said that I shouldn't have done that, that it was too personal, and that people didn't think he was articulate, and it went into his stuttering. Um, I, I, I can't even remember whether I had the detail in there. He claimed that one of the ways that one of the impetus forces that got him to get over his stutter was that when he was baptizing some of the baby chicks in a lard can, he stuttered while saying the prayer and they drowned. Um, <laughs> so he wanted to be able to do the prayers faster. Um, right. So this was an incredible character talking about growing up in Troy, Alabama in a, in a shotgun house that you could see through uh, tar paper. But then the next thing I know, he came to me and he says I'm, that he was going to put preaching to the chickens into his book um, <laughs> after being mad. And in a way, it's kind of like a, a detail from the African-American History Museum. Uh, you're nervous about it, but it is so human that it's become part of the defining story of John Lewis, that, that he felt this kinship with the chickens and that he would want to preach to them. And he would, he would literally protest when, when the family wanted to kill a chicken, which, which, which may, marked him as a very, very unusual uh, young boy, which, of course, he was. Um, so um, those are my stories with him. Uh, I, I was also part of a reconciliation between him and Julian Bond. You know, they ran against yep. each other in 1986 in a celebrated, very, very tense race for Congress that John won. Um, and they didn't see each other again until the two of them and I got an honorary degree at Dillard University that was engineered to try to bring them back together, and it worked. And it worked largely because of John's sense of grace and his sense of humor, uh, which was always really, really, and all, many things about him were not understood or, or he was totally different than what people's expectations were. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. he was a terrific dancer. Um, mm -hmm and um, very live and that sort of thing. What, those are some of my stories about John Lewis. What, how, do you, how do you feel about him? I know he was so proud of, of this museum. Well, it was so important to me to make John proud. Um, and what I was struck by was his generosity um, and his concern for others. And now that sounds like something trite, but I can remember many moments during the process of building the museum that John Lewis would call me and just say, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, who do you need me to talk to in Congress? What do you need me to, I mean, the generosity of saying, I will do whatever it takes to get this done. And I think one of the things I learned from John is resiliency, is that, um, no battle is won overnight, and that the 11 years of building a museum seemed long to me, but when I looked at the arc of history, when I looked at John's life, it was quick. And I think the other thing I remember more than anything else is walking John through the museum for the first time. Mm. Um, and hearing him give me a John Hope Franklin-like lecture. Let me tell you what this means to me. And then we got to Emmett Till and he cried. And as you said, he talked about how that was him and that um, he was so proud that we could tell the story in a way that was meaningful, that honored Emmett, but also honored his mother. And that's when I knew we had done a good job, when John Hope, when John Hope was happy and John Lewis was happy. <laughs> You could tell us now if there was ever a moment when you thought the magazine, the, the museum would not make it. You know, there was never a moment where I thought we wouldn't make it. 
there were many moments where I thought maybe I'm not good enough as the leader to get us through the politics and the fundraising. Um, but I would say if there was one moment where I really did think that we might fail, it was the water moment. Because I think people were just throwing up their hands and there was a sense of, well, let's just fill the hole up and forget about it. Um, so that was the moment I thought we could fail. But I realized that every time I doubted, I dipped into history. I said, here is a community that didn't quit. Here's a community that sort of believed in an America that didn't believe in them. So I never thought we wouldn't pull it off, in part because the Scholarly Advisory Committee of people like you and, and Janetta Cole and um, Bernice Johnson Regan and you know so many others, you believed and you challenged and you gave us the support to do this. So I really always thought we'd pull it off. I just wasn't sure exactly when. <laughs> I'd like to end, I, I think our time is uh, about out, but I'd like to end with a very, very tough, but I think hopeful question, which is this. Today, America's divided in a partisan way uh, as in no other time. We say that frequently, but a lot of that is defined by race, or at least it's perceived right. to be that way. One party right. has a lot of black people, the other party doesn't, and right. racial division is, is, is thought to drive uh, the partisan divide. In that case, you wouldn't expect much bipartisan cooperation to build this museum. But one of the most inspiring themes that I heard from you over the course of our years working together were the contributions of Republicans like Laura Bush and, yep. and others. So could you talk a little bit about bipartisanship in the support for the museum? Absolutely. I think that part of what was so important to me was to tap that bipartisan nature, even in a partisan time. So when I came back from Chicago, um, there, was a, there was a Republican congressman from the north side of Chicago who was close to me, and he guided me through. He said, let's make sure that both the Republicans and the Democrats understand what you're trying to do. And then I have to give so much um, applause to George Bush and to Laura Bush. In many ways, there was, as you remember, there were groups of people who said this museum should not be on the mall. Um, and then George Bush, the President of the United States says, of course it should be on the mall. Um, and just that sentence helped me um, in so many ways dealing with other Republicans and being able to say, you may not like it, but the President of the United States says it should be on the mall. And then I think that I had gotten to know Laura Bush before I really knew George Bush. And I was so taken by Laura Bush's commitment to fairness and to understanding through literature that when they left the White House, um, I asked her, would she serve on our, our board? And she said, yes. She said she wasn't gonna do anything else but that. But what really hit me about her is during the inauguration, whenever inaugurations are, are done, a lot of it's paid for private. And when the money that isn't all spent, the first lady decides where it would go. And at the second inauguration, she decided that a lot of the money that was left over would go to the museum. So she made that kind of commitment. So I have been really taken by um, the Bush's commitment to the museum. And you remember the opening day. I think George Bush gave the best speech of his life, talking about how a great nation confronts its past, doesn't run from its past. And that was also that day of that wonderful photograph of Michelle hugging um, President Bush that is really a symbol of the America we believe in. Yeah, the, the, the museum managed to do some transformative bipartisan um, mo moments that America sorely, sorely needs to replicate uh, today. And um, I was very inspired by that. You know, Laura Bush, um, I interacted with her at the same time because she had been the creator of the National Book Festival. Down well, that's on right. And um, she had me there for two of my books about the King years. Uh, that came out during during that period, and she would always come and talk about it. And her um, her interest is really genuine and substantive. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you're you're in the line here. I have to say hello and something polite to you. Um, she, she you could tell that she that she really loved the substance of books, 
and and she loved to talk about the the process of creating them and uh so it's it it makes sense that she would be so committed to this museum and i think we're really lucky for it were, were there other republicans in the same uh I, I don't mean in the same category but also that were helpful well i think there were a lot of republican leadership john Boehmer Boehmer was important um so so many people once they heard the story that this wasn't an attempt to point fingers and look at guilt it was an attempt to help us as Americans come together and find reconciliation and hope. Well, I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful bipartisan, hopeful uh, moment. Lonnie, I really always love talking to you. And uh, I hope everybody who hasn't already been to this museum can go virtually and go in person whenever, um, whenever we overcome this COVID virus. And, um, I'd like to turn things back over to Skip uh, now, if, if, if he's available. Thank you, Taylor. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Uh, the National Museum is our nation's story. Uh, and we really thank you for sharing it. It's particularly uh, special to us uh, here in Arkansas because of the role of Little Rock Central uh, in 1957 played in that story. And I know you have the Carlotta Walls Lanier collection uh, as part of that. And one of the great untold stories that you have in the museum, but I think is clearly to be told, is what happened in Elaine, Arkansas, in the Elaine uh, race riots. I, that, that, is, that is a story waiting to be told. And uh, it's one of the most significant events in history. And I, I hope people will focus on that. I know people in Arkansas. If I had a chance to ask a question, I almost interrupted Taylor, but I, I didn't want to do that. But uh, I think uh, this Black Lives Movement matter is just strong and it's so needed and, and, and Black Lives do matter. And it, they've mattered in history for years that you've recorded, but it'll be real interesting to see how the African American National Museum puts this Black Lives Matter in the context of history and how this younger generation then comes back and brings their children and grandchildren to see this important, I think monumental, life-changing uh, time in American history. So thank you very, very much uh, for being with us. Taylor, you are awesome. Uh, it's good to have you back. Every year uh, at, at, at our school, we ask our incoming students uh, to pick a book that they would recommend that others read, any book, fiction, nonfiction, whatever. And then we display those books and then put them in our library. And every year when I ask the students that, they always ask me this question, well, what book do you recommend? And the book that I proudly recommend, and I've recommended it ever since I've been Dean, is Parting the Waters. Uh, your, uh, your remarkable Pulitzer Prize winning uh, work is just extraordinary. And for people that have not read it, read it and reread it. So thank you very, very much. I want to thank uh, the Capiris family. I want to thank AT&T, uh, the Clinton Foundation. Stephanie, thank you for your kind words. And Ben, thank you for making sure I was unmuted. Uh, and uh, I am uh, grateful for that. And a special thanks to you, Jamie Harrell, for interpreting. Uh, you've been a big part of this. Uh, and we are, we are so appreciative for you being with us tonight. So for all that joined us from all over the country, uh, thank you for participating. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, be safe, be well, uh, and take care of yourselves. Thank you all.